Good morning again. We have been doing a sermon series, if you're uh, joining us for the first time today, through the summer called Road Trip. And each week we've been visiting a different location, a place, if you will, that has been mentioned in both the Old Testament and the New Testament and taking a look at what has taken place in that location. And today is no different. We continue on our road trip today. And through this series, um, there has been a lot of history. Um, I have dug into some history and tried to make sense of it because sometimes that doesn't make sense to me. And um, uh, Siri was going to respond just now. So I think I'll just, she said, I don't know if I understand. Yeah, I don't know either, Siri, but anyway. <laughs> so um, so some of that has all been, all of that history has been, you know, from years and, you know, centuries, millennia ago. But before we start on that, I want to just look back, oh, I don't know, about 300 years ago. About 300 years ago, during the 1700s. In what was known then as the British colonies at least for most of that century until the Revolutionary War happened. There were a couple of historical thing, uh, events that took place, and I'm not talking about the Boston Tea Party or the Revolutionary War or anything like that. I'm talking today about something called the Great Awakening. And then a little bit later in the 1700s, the Second Great Awakening. How many of you have ever heard of this, the Great Awakening? Okay, so yeah, um, it's, it's not completely foreign. Um, these were religious movements, religious movements through which a message was given to people. And this is not an unfamiliar message. The message was, there are sinful ways. There are ways that we live that are broken, that don't lead to life. And it's important for us to see those things for the way they are and to repent of them, to turn to make a turning in our life, accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, and receiving this, this understanding of salvation that we've been saved, not by our own works, but by what has been given to us as a gift. This is amazing grace, we sung. This is unfailing love, we sung. And this is the message during that time of the Great Awakening. It was... Um, much of the movement was in contradiction to the Enlightenment. If you go back a couple hundred years before that, there was this whole thing that took place um, called the Enlightenment, and that was um, a time of science and a time when people were taught to question faith, and there was a diminishing role for God in daily life. So that was, that was the result of the Enlightenment. And so the, the Great Awakenings, these were in response to that, calling people back to faith, to claiming their faith, and to recognizing their need for salvation. Now, in the earlier part of the 1700s, there were great preachers like Jonathan Edwards, and George Whitfield, who traveled around the colonies preaching in fields because churches weren't big enough to hold the crowds that were coming to hear this message of salvation. And in the later part of the century, there were um, camp meetings that began to take place. We might think of them as tent revivals. And that took root in Kentucky. And it began to spread through the, through the colonies, but then on into the American frontier. Um, these spiritual experiences, or great awakenings, refers to what happens in the spirit when you hear this message of repentance and claiming, claiming the name of Jesus Christ and receiving this, this new day in your life. It was, it was an eye-opening experience for people. That's why it's called a great awakening, having your eyes open to the truth of the gospel. 
And large numbers of people, this happened to large numbers of people, and that created a movement that has affected American society ever since. It, has, it was what developed religious life as we know it in America. These spiritual experiences of salvation happened for a lot of people in one day, perhaps. They would be called to remember their faith. And then in later years, they might actually think about that day when they gave their life to the Lord, that day when they repented, that day when they received this, this feeling of salvation, this gift of salvation, they would remember that day. It was a great awakening of that day experience. But it wasn't just in the American colonies and frontier where it was first experienced. That day took place in today's road trip destination, which is Damascus. Damascus. Damascus currently is in modern-day country of Syria. Um, but way back when, um, it has probably been identified by archaeologists as one of the longest continuously occupied cities in the world. There's a few of them. Jericho is one of them. We visited there. Uh, Jericho may be the oldest, but Damascus is, 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 is pretty ancient as well. Damascus was established as a city long before the Israelite history really began. As a matter of fact, when Abraham, before he was known as Abraham, he was known as Abram, when his nephew Lot was captured in a war, Lot was taken into captivity way north around Damascus. And the story in Genesis 16 and 17 tells about how Abram grabbed a bunch of friends and they went north and they went into battle to retrieve Lot, and they, they were able to do that, and they brought Lot home. Damascus has been around for a long time. And Damascus also has a patchwork history of government. It hasn't always been ruled over by the same um, people, if you will, the same king, the same kind of control. Sometimes it was under Armenian control. Sometimes it was under the control of the northern kingdom called Israel. Eventually, it was overcome by the Assyrian Empire. I told you this is a lot of history. And if your eyes are starting to glaze, I'm, I, I hope you hang in there just for a minute longer. Um, they were overcome by the Assyrian Empire, and that was the same empire that overcame the northern kingdom called Israel. Long about the year 732 B.C. So a long time ago. Long time ago. But it was that event when the Assyrian army came in to Damascus. It was that event that Isaiah wrote about and prophesied about. He said, See, Damascus will no longer be a city. Imagine hearing that. And, and Damascus has been around for a long time. It is a built-up, fortified city, meaning it's got a wall around it, and it's got a lot of strength to it, and it's got a lot of numbers to it. And Isaiah is saying, see, Damascus will no longer be a city. It would be like us hearing the words, see, Chicago will no longer be a city. And we can't imagine that amount of destruction, perhaps. And Isaiah goes on, but will become a heap of ruins. The fortified city will disappear, and the royal power from Damascus will disappear. The remnant of Aram will be like the glory of the Israelites. But Isaiah prophesied not only about what would happen to the physical city, but he, pro he prophesied also about what was going to happen to the hearts of people. That they would have a that day experience or a great awakening experience. Because Isaiah goes on, he says, in that day, 
People will look to their maker. And they will turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. They will not look to the altars, the work of their hands, and they will have no regard for the Asherah poles and the incense altars their fingers have made. Once again, we hear the convicting reality of a people who had been worshiping other gods, namely Baal, Asherah, and perhaps even there in Damascus, Hadad. He was a storm god, who the Romans then started calling Zeus, who was at the Greeks. I'm not real good with the Roman Greek mythology. But what they would do, how they would do that, is they would make these statues with their own hands. They would create the very gods that they would bow down to and worship. They would create these poles and dance around them and pray around them, poles that, that were about Asherah. And they would set up these temples to these other gods. And so with the destruction of Damascus, it also means that there's the temples and those idols that would be destroyed as well. Leaving not one single idol for the people to worship. Not one single thing that their hands had made could they worship. They were left with a spiritual awakening that the only thing that they could worship was their maker, the Holy One of Israel. That's what they were left with. Everything else would be ripped apart from them. And what was left was this realization, this spiritual great awakening that the only God that they had was the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah called that event that day. That day. It's a day like no other. It's a day when the eyes of the heart are opened and deep spiritual truths entered. It was the kind of day that people on the American frontier would experience with the camp meetings in the Great Awakening. A day when lives are changed because hearts have changed, because spiritual truth of God has come into the human heart. But Damascus isn't known only for that day that Isaiah talked about. We also know of a time when it happened 750 years later. There will be a quiz. No, I'm just kidding. 750 years later, listen to what takes place once again around Damascus. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, now the way is what the church was originally called, the way, the way to understand God. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, 
go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here on authority, with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My guess is that this is probably a familiar story for a lot of you. It's a story about a man who is deeply engaged in his religion, and in that he is deeply offended by an offshoot of that same religion that was taking place. It was created, this offshoot of religion was created by people who had followed a self-proclaimed rabbi who taught lessons that challenged the religious establishment. They even, these people who followed this self-proclaimed rabbi who challenged the religious establishment, these people even claimed that the rabbi who had been put to death and buried in a sealed tomb was alive. Ridiculous stuff. Insane stuff. And Saul was going to put an end to it. He was on a mission. So he got his arrest warrants. He got all of his paperwork put together. After all, he was a lawyer. And he got all of his authority in place. And he took it upon himself to travel to Damascus, where a lot of those Christians were. And we know how that story goes as he approaches Damascus. He's blinded by the light. Questioned by a voice that ended up being the very one that he was persecuting. That man, Saul, had a that day experience that he would never forget. And he never did. It changed him through and through. He talked about what happened to him. He wrote about what happened to him over and over and over again. He was telling people, let me tell you, this stuff is real. I experienced it. He would tell his witness and how much it had changed him. It changed his beliefs. It changed his religion. He learned that day that the religion that he had made with his own hands, kind of like the people in Damascus years and years and years before, how they would make their God, their religion with their own hands. Saul had made his religion not a physical idol, but a theology that made it impossible for anyone to be loved by God. And that religion that he'd made with his own hands on that day on the road to Damascus was destroyed. And he was left with nothing to call upon except for his very basic faith in his maker and to call upon the Holy One of Israel that had been revealed to him as Jesus Christ. Saul had a that day experience, a great awakening, if you will. But he wasn't the only one in Damascus at that time. Ananias did as well, I think. Ananias, who is this Christian who is who was probably hiding out in his faith, afraid of Saul. He'd heard about Saul, knew that Saul was on his way, knew that he was a Christian and 
And he was, he was so afraid of what Saul might do to them. After all, Saul had, had overseen the stoning, the murder of Stephen, the very first Christian martyr. What can happen to the human heart when we become afraid? We get closed off, don't we? It was in that closed off place <laughs> that Saul says to the Lord, when the Lord says, I want you to go down to the straight street to a man there from Tarsus named Saul. <laughs> and Ananias has the audacity to say, I'm not so sure about that, God. Have you ever said that to God? Ever said that to the Lord? The Lord wants you to do something and you're like, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not quite sure that that's a good idea, Lord. But Ananias did, and he had a that-day experience in which he experienced the power of the Holy Spirit to truly change somebody. He actually laid hands on Saul, his persecutor, called him Brother Saul. Ananias had a that-day experience, and he witnessed something powerful happen. In Saul. Damascus, our road trip destination for today, it is a place where our eyes are opened to the truth. I almost feel like we need to have an altar call. And I know that just made all of you nervous. Because perhaps we might find that we are a lot like those ancient Damascus people. We have begun to trust in the other gods of our world, the things that our hands have made, whether it's our wealth or whether it's our political stances or parties. Maybe we've just become worshiping too much of things that are made by us and not the maker of all of us. Or perhaps, like Saul, we've trusted in our own righteousness. And you know what happens when we trust in our own righteousness? We find ourselves not in need of a Savior because I'm just good enough and I don't need to be saved. Thank you very much, Jesus. I got this. None of us have this. There's not a one of us that doesn't need the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ. Or perhaps, like Ananias, we've forgotten to trust that God is still at work in this world. God has not forsaken this world. As much as we'd like to say that God has, or that we like to say the world is going you know where in a handbasket, right? That's not the story of our faith. That's not the trajectory that Jesus Christ has set us on. Perhaps, like Ananias, we're hiding out in fear, not trusting what the Holy Spirit is able to do. So I wonder if today is a that day for you, for any reason. Is today a day when we need to turn our eyes to the Holy One of Israel and experience what something new can happen in our heart and in our lives? A day when we become awakened or reawakened. A second, a third, a fourth, a tenth awakening of our spirit. You know, during those camp meetings, during that, those great awakenings, people would sometimes just sit and cry with deep realization. Some people would come forward to pray kneel down. Some people would kneel in repentance and acceptance. So I pray that if something is happening in your heart today, let it. Let it be that day for you. Would you pray with me?
Lord Jesus, we confess that we like the things that we make and we trust in them, but all of those things end up failing, and you are the only one that doesn't. So help us put our whole trust in your grace and to promise to serve you as our Lord. Lord, we confess that sometimes we get it wrong. And we can be so adamant in our wrongness, like Saul, that we can be blinded to the truth. Shine your light upon us and help us to see what it is that we need to know and how we need to change. Lord Jesus, we confess that Sometimes we're like Ananias, forgetting to trust in you and in the power of your present spirit among us, that you are at work in the world today. For what each one of us needs to grow in our spiritual journey with you, Lord, send us that truth. Help us to live in that Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.